Hello. Uh, welcome to uh, Jonathan Franklin's um, bachelor's thesis presentation um, at the Department of Mathematics at Uppsala University. He'll talk to us about mapped regular paintings. Thank you. So uh, I'll talk about uh, mapped regular pavings. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, like a brief overview, and then I'll dive deeper into the mathematics and see if we can get somewhere. So um, mapped regular uh, pavings, like the foundation is uh, the tree structure. Um, which is a hierarchical data structure that uh, organizes multidimensional data. And that will be very important for many of the algorithms because they make use of this uh, structure for uh, recursions. And uh, a, regular, a regular paving is a finite succession of bisections that partitions uh, a box in uh, a d-dimensional uh, uh, real valued space into sub boxes uh, and uh, map regular pavings is an extension of that uh, where you map uh, regular pavings to uh, functions from uh, or values from a set. Uh, so map regular pavings are used to create this piecewise constant approximations of functions and uh, the benefits uh, of using uh, mapped regular pavings is they are very computationally efficient uh, algorithms and operations. And uh, because of that, they can work well even in large uh, uh, dimensions and with uh, large samples of the data. And uh, they're very flexible. So you can, uh, if you need very high precisions, you can use. Uh, make lots of splits and get a very detailed approximation. But then you need to store that in uh, the computer's memory as well. So you can balance that. And we will see in some of the algorithms later that um, there are good ways to uh, balance that. So uh, it's uh, frequently used in the literature for density estimation, uh, such as marginal density, uh, conditional density. Um, it's, uh, uh, you, you can slice it and uh, such. I, I even think, uh, Rasesh told me that there is a master student right now that works with uh, um, uh, fraud in banks, for example, I think, I have not looked at that, but I think that uses the density estimation. You can also use adaptive multivariate histograms uh, using a randomized priority queue. This randomized priority queue is uh, um, used in many papers as well. Um, you can estimate the posterior given a prior. And some of the real world use cases are analyzing big data of flight tra trajectories where you can make use of uh, regular pavings to uh, make statistics of, for example, the most popular flight routes during different weather conditions. And you can also, you could also expand that to um, animal tracking. Um, and yeah, you can use it for predicting crime targeting advertisement and uh, fellowships, uh, business analytics and anomaly detection and many more. So the tree structure is, um, as pre stated previously, very important for many of the algorithms. And uh, some of the advantages of this is that it's very well suited for spatial divide and conquer methods. Uh, where you uh, divide a problem into subproblems and then tackle the subproblems. Um, it has order log n access time for any subbox um, in a collection of m subboxes, and that's uh, regardless of the dimension of those uh, boxes. 
uh, constant time for insertion and deletion without needing to reallocate uh, the other points. And it has very elegant uh, algorithms. They're easy to understand that we will see later on. So uh, diving into some of the math behind the regular pavings. Um, so we have this uh, interval, um, a compact real interval, uh, where this uh, x lower bar denotes the lower, lower bound, and this is the upper bound with the bar above it. Um, and uh, we can define the midpoints, uh, width, and radius. And for this uh, definition, you need to know the midpoint, which just basically right in the middle of the interval. We can use that. Uh, so first we take the index of the widest. Um, so if we have a, a box consisting of like a Cartesian product of many of these uh, intervals, we can take the index of the largest or the widest interval. Um, and we take the first one of these and we apply a bisection or split right in the middle of uh, this index, which will leave us with this um, um, half open um, left. Um, like it, give this, it gives this child nodes or child boxes with uh, the half open uh, uh, interval and uh, closed interval. And it needs to be half open uh, here because we don't want any overlap, any points that are shared between these uh, uh, left and right nodes. And uh, by applying uh, many of these uh, bisections, starting from uh, a root box, uh, that is how we get a regular paving or how we define it. So we'll go over a simple one-dimensional example. Uh, here we start with the root node. And this corresponds to then in this one-dimensional example, we will only have one um, coordinate. So it, it will be the entire interval. And after a split, we map this uh, left node to this left half open interval. And the right node to this uh, uh, closed interval. Then we have a choice here, but let's say we split the right one. This will then map this one to this uh, interval and uh, this uh, node to the other interval. And it splits uh, directly in the middle every time. And it's very important for some of the algorithms later, such as the UNO. Then we have a two-dimensional example. Uh, here it's a little less trivial. So the root node, it corresponds to the entire root box. And then, <clears throat> and then we have, uh, when we make the first bisection, we make it on the first coordinate here. We have two equally wide coordinates and it's always on the first coordinate. And, uh, the x coordinates uh, is uh, used as the first coordinate. You could do it the other way, but you need to do it the same way every time so that uh, these will map to a unique regular paving. And if we split um, this uh, row R node into two child nodes, it will. Um, we will need to split at the vertical coordinates because here the vertical side is much longer, it's twice as long as the horizontal side. We always split, split the widest coordinate, the first widest. We can do the same thing on the other side. We get this one and then we can, um, uh, we can do it on this one as well. And, uh, yeah, we can, we map the splits. And this time it's on the horizontal coordinates again, because two equally wide coordinates, it's always the first one, so the horizontal one. So 
if you want the volume of a, a sub box, then uh, the regular way works. We just uh, take the, the largest uh, point of the interval, subtract the smallest points, then we get the length of a side. And we multiply that side by all the other sides. That's a way, a standard way to do it. We could also use the depth of a node uh, to calculate the volume. Uh, so the depth of a node is the minimum number of splits to reach that node. Um, and then once we have the depth, we can use that in the formula. So first we take the volume of the root node. We divide it by two raised to the power of the depth of the node corresponding to the subbox where we want the formula, uh, the, the volume. So <clears throat> I will introduce this ordered leaf depth string notation. Uh, and uh, it's a good way to introduce, uh, to explain the depth of it. So uh, for the root node, it, it's always depth zero. So S zero means, uh, I, I should first explain. So order leaf, uh, leaf depth uh, string notation. You take the leaf nodes uh, from left to right and you write the depth of them. So here there's only one node. It's of depth zero because you need zero splits uh, to reach, it, reach this node. Uh, in this one, you have two leaf nodes, uh, row L and row R. Uh, both are depth one because one split is required. You can also look uh, at it like there is uh, one line uh, um, to reach then from the root node. Here we uh, start from left. Uh, this one is of depth one. These two are of depth two. Uh, here, uh, all are depth two. Uh, it did, we did uh, uh, more splits than two to uh, reach this, but this is the minimal splits that is defined as the depth of the node. And so the minimal way to do it would be with, with two for each one of those. And uh, here you can see the ones for the uh, more one, larger one. Um, so the number of distinct binary trees with the K splits is equal to the Catalan number. And uh, yeah, so I use this uh, image. It's not my image. It's from uh, my supervisor's uh, uh, paper. But we see that uh, for the first one, there's uh, with zero splits, there's one example of such a uh, regular paving. With one split, there's also one example. You can only do it one way. There's, uh, if you do two splits, there's two examples. For the rest, it's, uh, for three splits, it's five. And if you continue, you will continue to follow this uh, pattern of the Catalan number. So it would be 14 and 42 and so on. Uh, so we come to the most uh, important uh, algorithm of uh, um, of uh, regular pavings. So this is the union operation. Uh, it's uh, a crucial uh, algorithm, and it can be seen. Uh, first, it's limited to regular pavings. They must share the same root box. Uh, it wouldn't make sense if they were different dimensions or different root boxes. Um, and uh, uh, under only this assumption, uh, regular pavings are closed under union operations. So if you take the union of two uh, regular pavings, you always get another regular paving. And it is because of this uh, strict bisection rule that uh, this is true. And um, how you do it, uh, you could see it as like superimposing the uh, regular pavings uh, on top of each other, or you take the most um, 
most bisected parts of each regular paving. Uh, you could also think it of it as a union bet between trees. Then you would take the one with the parts with the most, most branches from each tree and you would uh, get some union of them. So it's a, a recursive uh, formula. So if both are leaves, then you just copy it. Uh, if one if leaf is a leaf and the other is not, then you just, you take the most complicated one, uh, namely the one that's not a leaf and you copy that one. And uh, yeah, if both of them are not leaf, then you make a recursive call uh, where you grafts, graft the left and right child nodes of them uh, into the recursive form and then return them. So now we're ready to introduce map regular pavings um, and give the definition. So if S is part of, um, uh, this is notation for um, uh, regular pavings made with uh, zero to infinity splits. Uh, though I don't think you can have inf infinite splits, but uh, at least up to that. Uh, and say you have some roots, uh, root node in some root box and you have a set uh, Y that needs to be non-empty. You take, uh, so uh, this is a set of all nodes. Uh, so you take, uh, it's F, let F be a mapping from the set of all nodes to this set Y, which is arbitrary, it could be anything we like or um, it needs to be non-empty, but, um, and so you map this, uh, uh, these nodes to some value where the nodes are from the uh, set of nodes and the value is from Y. And this map is called a Y mapped regular paving. So we can get uh, the image of a point using the point wise image. So if it's a recursive function again, uh, as many of these algorithms are, so if it's a leaf, you, that's base case, you just return the value of that leaf. And uh, else you just look in the uh, right or left sub box, depending on where the point is, and you return the value from that sub box. You, re, you make a recursive call and you eventually get it. So let's see some examples. We, we can have this uh, real mapped uh, valued uh, regular paving. So we see we have made some splits to this uh, interval. Um, so we take this sub interval. We see that this is mapped to two. Um, and uh, this one is mapped to um, one and so on. <laughs> we can have a, a 2D uh, Boolean map to regular paving where these values are one or two or true or false. Uh, you can even do color mappings using some RGB color uh, mapping. Uh, so we can also uh, make minimize the memory usage using uh, this uh, algorithm, minimize leaves. So if you, it begins by just saying, if, if it's not a leaf, then ca uh, call the function on the uh, child nodes of that, that node. And then it also checks, uh, so, if it's a cherry, then and uh, the values of the child nodes are the same, then you can prune those off and assign that value to the cherry node. Uh, so after you prune prune them off, prune them off, then you will have uh, the cherry node carrying the same value. So here we see uh, in this example we have two uh, child nodes here that are 
or two sibling nodes that are exactly the same value. So it's kind of redundant to have this. So we can uh, uh, use uh, this minimize leaves algorithm and it will um, combine them into one node that is, uh, will give the exact same answer for each point, but uh, it's uh, simpler and uh, more memory efficient. And the reason that uh, we can't use it on these two uh, nodes is because they are not sibling nodes. These two are sibling nodes and these two are, but uh, since they don't, these two have a, a common parent, but they, uh, this, these two don't, so we can't combine them for that reason. We can also extend the uh, arithmetic to the uh, data structure itself. So if we have the, let's uh, F and G be two Y mapped regular paving with the same root box, then we can uh, extend the arithmetic to the regular pavings themselves uh, through implementing uh, uh, pointwise operations. But uh, this is only under the uh, assumption that these operations are well defined in the uh, sets that we are mapping to. So another histogram example is we, we take this and uh, uh, we take two histograms and we add them to each other and we get this uh, this histogram, which we saw in the previous slide. So you add, uh, this one has value one, this one has uh, value two, you add them together, you get three, same for this. And here, even though this is uh, uh, not as split up as this one, we can still add it. And it will give one extra to each of these. And also, uh, so this is uh, three-dimensional color mapped uh, regular pavings using the same RGB um, mapping that I talked, I introduced a two-dimensional example earlier. So uh, it's this, I think it's like uh, you, you have three values, uh, uh, red, green, and blue, and you do combinations of these and, um, yeah, and then you can add different color combinations. And um, I think I think it's defined so that if we go over the values that are allowed, it will just uh, round down because I, the largest is like one, one, one and smallest is zero, zero, zero. Uh, I think zero, zero, zero is white and yeah. Uh, anyway, as long as it's well-defined, it's possible to do. Um, this is a lengthy algorithm. I won't go through it in depth. I will just say that, so the way it works, say you run into uh, uh, where one node is a leaf and the other is not. The way you handle that is you make these temporary nodes and uh, you can think of them as like dummy nodes. And then you make a recursive call with um, the dummy nodes where they carry the same value as the node they are coming from. So you just send them down and that way uh, the algorithm can keep track of the uh, yeah, value and apply it to the, to the one that's not a leaf node. So an important theorem here, uh, the enclosing range of functions um, because what this tells us is that we can get uh, um, as close as we want. If we're trying to approximate a function, um, we can enclose that as close, in theory, we can enclose it as close as we like um, using the next algorithm. Um, so if we look at this, um, here we have this uh, epsilon and epsilon um, is like a given tolerance for how far away from the exact function we want it to be. And the previous theorems basically states that we can get as close as we'd like. But uh, the issue with that is 
while we can make it as uh, small as we want, uh, the memory uh, might run out because we need to make like a lot of splits and we will have a lot of sub boxes with uh, different values mapped to them. And uh, <clears throat> you need to store that somehow in the computer's memory. Uh, so while in theory we can get that close, it's not really feasible in practice. Uh, so uh, if we want to do it another way, we could define this priority function, um, which maps from the leaves to, uh, to R or the targets, and uh, decides which splits to make based on this uh, priority function. And uh, so we have this RPQ and close, um, which um, you can see it has this uh, function which uh, keeps track of the uh, volume and uh, the function of the regular paving. Uh, and the, there is a, a maximum number of leaves as well, so that we can ensure that we don't run out of memory. Uh, but even this is uh, only guaranteed to make locally optimal splits. Uh, it doesn't actually guarantee that we uh, meet the globally, uh, uh, reach like the global, globally optimal map juggler paving uh, for this function. If we, the only way to do that would be to actually uh, go through all of them which is larger than the cattle number, which grows very fast. And it's uh, really not computationally feasible uh, to try and uh, reach the global ones. So um, we have this um, improved strategy, uh, which is not globally optimal, but it's guaranteed to do as, at least as well as the previous algorithm where we split more nodes uh, than optimal to begin with, which uh, uh, creates this tight range enclosure. Uh, then you can use, uh, use that uh, range enclosure and move that to the internal nodes and then pr prune off the leaf nodes. Uh, and uh, then you get this um, uh, equal good or better approximation. So this is the one for uh, tightening the range enclosure. Uh, and uh, then we use this one to prune off the nodes that contribute the least to the, uh, this priority function. Um, so in conclusion, uh, map regular pavings, it's a very computationally efficient data structure. Uh, they can be used for piecewise constant approximations of functions. And uh, these approximations can, in theory, lie as close as we want to the true function. Although, um, as seen, we need to take into consideration the, the memory as well and uh, optimize for that. And uh, I, I briefly touched on the many use cases, uh, primarily, I would say, the density estimation from what I've seen. So are there any questions? Well, thanks for the presentation, Jonathan. Um, Thank you. Um, are there any questions? <laughs> so Jonathan, uh, what is um, one of the use cases that you found the most interesting? Yeah, so let me see if I can go back. I, I read this um, flight trajectories uh, uh, paper and um, that was one of the, it was the second paper I read. So 
uh, I'm, I might be a bit biased because of that, but uh, that was uh, very interesting. And it's um, also intuitive uh, from the paper what you use it for and um, seemed very practical. So I like that one. Yeah, that's good. I like that paper too. So yeah. There was actually a, a, a NASA open challenge on what's called collision-free arithmetics. Ah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, you mentioned uh, the other master student. Um, so yeah, he's uh, working on regular pavings, but for uh, problems where the amount of data is in petabyte scale, right? But it's too much yeah. data. So not you can't use one computer because there's memory limitations in one computer. So he's using a, a distributed framework to do these kinds of density estimations and tree arithmetics. Yeah. Um, I have one more question. Um, what, how do you see some of these regular map pavings um, how can they be used in the, with the AI technology? Are they embedded in the technology? Um, There's so many, I would say, suppliers and mentors out there that have AI technology. Is are they? Is this how how does this get used in the AI technology, or is it used in the AI technology? Yes, I I'm not exactly sure, but um, I know that you can use ai to learn from like different features and um, so you might uh, need uh, uh, map regular pavings to handle the data as it streams in and maybe you can uh, apply an ai um, to that data but to be honest i don't exactly know and maybe rasesh can answer the question a bit better yeah uh, well it's a good question uh, i mean i don't know ai is uh i mean ai is basically regression on steroids or something right so you, you're mm -hmm. using classical data structures and statistical models and, but it's just that uh you're using a lot more computational power uh that's one way to think about ai so uh yeah in from that point of view you know, density estimation is uh, one of the most basic things you can do for certain kinds of predictions. So, I mean, we have some examples where um, in some cases we could use density estimations from um, regular pavings to try and detect unusual, um, say, transactions in, 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 a, in a financial context. So an unusual transaction, financial transaction, usually is a signal of uh, a fraud, for example, right? So um, it is possible, and usually, um, yeah, you can use mapped regular pavings, um, you know, to do predictions. But they they are they are unfortunately limited. You know, it's not a magic for everything. Uh, the limitation is basically the dimensionality. So, um, but they work. They work well with other. Um, AI algorithms. Hi, Jonathan. Maybe I can try one. When we see those uh, algorithm examples with the mathematical formulas, it looks kind of condensed programming. If Surely, program this will it be extensive coding, or is that also <laughs> short and crisp as the algorithm examples? Um, right. So, depending on the language you implement it, uh, it might be a bit different. Uh, but uh, honestly, the tree structures make this algorithm so so short and elegant i don't think uh, the implementation would be hard at all um yes uh, there are other algorithms depending on uh, the applications for example with the uh, flight trajectories you might need to load in the data and uh, stuff like that 
So, um, yeah, it, it, by the algorithms themselves uh, seems uh, simple to me. I don't think that would be an issue. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good observation, actually. I totally agree. Uh, it depends on the language. Currently, the implementations are in C++ and it's Scala. Um, and I mean, another quick thing about AI, I haven't talked to Jonathan about this, is uh, there is actually a scientist robot in BMC, in uh, Biomedical uh, Research Center here in Uppsala. And this robot sort of uh, has a camera and then it kind of quickly um, moves through wells of cell lines that are treated with different chemicals. So it's used in drug discovery because the robot quickly takes photos, uh, lots and lots of photos of each cell line. So there we're we are hoping to, you know, use regular pavings to actually uh, model how the cell actually changes in, in space and time, right? So, so there once again, uh, you know, hopefully in, again in conjunction with other AI algorithms, um, regular pavings may be, may be helpful. And that project is called uh, mathematical morphology because you're studying how the shape of the cell changes. Um, Thank you, very interesting. Amazing, actually. We can do many things now with this. Sorry for the background noise. For We're in a cafe. cafe. <laughs> oh, that's fine, that's totally fine. So uh, are there any other questions? Unfortunately, a lot of uh, a lot of the other students couldn't join because it's the 28th, but Jonathan wanted to finish before the end of the year. So um, I don't have any other questions, um, Jonathan. So if there are no other questions, we can we stop the recording. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.